represent, guys. I'm on the job floor. Now you got me there. In order to improve fuel economy and engine flexibility while maintaining reduced level of emissions, engine manufacturers developed a system that changes the valve timing advanced while the engine is running. We used to have our old Pinto engines. We put the timing belt on, right? Everything had to be exactly right because we didn't want valves kissing when we sent the customer down the road. Now we're going to be moving that camshaft as the engine's running. Very tight up. Older guy like me, it's just it's mind blowing that we're doing that. But I've seen it on different applications, Larry, before we go further in it. Yeah. Where the valve, I've seen it on Subaru and Fletcher Rosette Nissan's. Like, you know, when you turn the cap, you gotta really turn the valve. So there's like a sort of overlap, but you still gotta time it. So when you start driving, you kind of advance the retard quite a lot. Because an interesting uh, okay. technology. And on. then we're going to get our camshaft phaser through our oil pressure, and we're going to be able to hold it. Is that why? Okay, so we don't go up. We're going to be able to hold that camshaft in the open position or in the closed position. Okay. So that's why they're left at the mechanical the way we did it. Okay. I, I, I have one of those phasers that was broken actually after they, they shear right off. I have one of those in, in my shop. And, and yeah. I work with Subaru who's that way too. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. This system can change the intake and the exhaust valve opening and closing in relation to the camshaft. Gives the engine a wider power band. Why is it giving the engine a wider power band? You want a lot more air and fuel. Exactly. We're going to be holding our intake valve. We're going to be opening our intake valve even earlier in the stroke. Yeah. Or later. Good torque at low speed and strong high speed performance. So if we're doing all that, we don't need to do. the trick with the intake, short or long runners, right? Yeah. Longer runners are going to help it, they're going to help it, but we no longer need those short runners for the high speed operation because we're doing it with our camshaft. And the manufacturers can reduce cost. So suddenly they're not building molds to build all these fancy intakes and more computer controls We've got one unit, and we're adjusting our, our pressure there. Adjusting our valve opening and closing there. While meeting the emission and fuel economy standards. We went to over our NOx. My buddies at GM were one of the very first ones to make one of the debatable, to mess with valve timing to reduce NOx. They were one of the very first ones that put an engine out into the showroom with no EGR valve. How did they do it? If we have a problem with exhaust temperature, let's find the solution to the exhaust temperature. We're going to open our exhaust valve earlier to evacuate that. They constantly messed around. That was quad four. Quad four was the first mass produced engine with no EGR valve. <coughs> And then we put that gas. Is that the dual over head count? What more? The camera was a more dual. Four cylinder? Yeah, it was 2.4. Yeah. Um, and then we go in on page 86, a table. I'm not going to go over the whole table, how we're doing, how we're doing that. Idling. We're opening our intake valve late, and we're closing our exhaust early. So go back to our chart on page 84. We're going from 21 degrees and 15 degrees, and we're doing this. So we're bringing it more into a, a really base auto cycle engine. And that's controlled by the vertical compact. We control that with the component we see, 
one way to do it, which we're going to see on page 89. And that is almost exactly what you were talking about on, on, on your Nissan, mm -hmm. the one I have in my shop at home. Yeah. We're controlling our oil pressure. Yeah. The OCV is controlled by ECM. It's electrical, mechanical, solenoid. I'm sure I have a picture of it here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Everybody see that? Electromechanical solenoid. We're going to open it. We're going to shuttle this back and forth. It's spring loaded. So it'll come back to its normal position. And all this will fall neutral. We're spinning this with our timing belt. At a certain RPM. Because our camshaft is timed. Because we have a camshaft sensor. We know exactly where our camshaft is at the right time. The ECM is going to shuttle this, close this, and pinch off both those ports at, at the point. Of, let's say we're accelerating. We want to accelerate hard, so we accelerate hard. What happens to our engine? We allow a whole bunch of air in it. We increase our pulse width. Engine RPM goes up. Oil pressure does what? <coughs> Goes up. Goes up. We have a high oil pressure throughout the entire system, as Mr. Pascal said. Right? Yeah. We shuttle this over, we close this, we close that, we don't allow the oil to escape. Suddenly we have high oil pressure trapped in here, and our camshaft is advanced. If it's advanced too far, then we can bleed this. We can pulse width. That also, so that so that that sensor level measures the amount of pressure in that oil. That sensor controls the oil pressure. That that actuator yeah. controls the oil pressure. Can't measure solenoid. Okay. Pardon me. Can't yeah. measure solenoid. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This in here, they're not showing it. This could be bolted to the engine anywhere. So, yeah. Generally, it's really close to this. It's generally on top of the engine in a pretty accessible place. Um, where the oil comes in is a critical place to look. If you have a camshaft phaser problem, as I said two days ago, and, and you've done your code, you've done your five column test, because you're going to get a P code for that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're going to get a customer complaint. Car's not running right. I don't have the power that I had before. You're going to get, and my check engine light's on. And this meal is on, right? So you're going to go through, you're going to find a P code for the camshaft phaser. You're going to do your five column chart, and it's going to tell you you have a bad problem. Because with your scan tool, you've tried to activate it, and you've tried to look at your camshaft position, and nothing changes. Ergo, I must have something not working here. Take it off, and you're looking at the inlet side of your camshaft phaser. It's a little screen inside there, a little filter. You see metal filings, putting a new camshaft phaser isn't going to solve the problem. You have to find the cause where those metal filings are coming from in your engine. Remember, we were talking about the thrust bearing on the, on the crankshaft. Yeah. Right? That's likely yeah. where you're, you're coming from. I have another like this before, sir. It's a Nissan Xterra. Uh, I have an encounter. There, yeah. There's a trouble with the uh, always can take bulk timing with uh, Nissan Xterra, and the problem is no acceleration. And always the code is can take, can take bulk timing. I check the signal is good, and I is part of the same problem. Yeah. And Look at the inlet side. Yes, yeah, me. Look at the inlet side. If you keep failing a component, it can't. Be. We, we build good cars now. Yeah, we really build good cars now. Okay. So there's a cost for the low, low, low power, low no acceleration? Yes, uh -huh. could, could be a problem, yeah. but not multiple times. Yeah. Not one time, yeah. 
twice, mm, really look for another problem. But try and not get to the second time. See there, the rule number one that came from an engineer builder shop, it's a sheet shop. It needs variable block times before you do or attempt anything. Start the vehicle, the operating temperature, oil setting in it out, hook up your, your gauge, and check for oil pressure specification. Yeah. If it's not within its range, don't even bother to do anything with phasers. Yes, that's rule number one. Yeah. You'll find that yeah. in your five column chart. Exactly. In your five column chart for a camshaft phaser, they'll tell you. Yeah. Check your oil pressure light on, yeah. check your oil, check your pressure. It's going to be somewhere in the top five. But yes, no, exactly. Yeah. That's the first thing you do. That's yeah. common sense. I have a, I have a sign in, at, at my school. Yeah. Right? Big sign. <laughs> Six by eight. There's common sense on it. Oh, yeah. and, and that's that's all we ask that people do is just pay attention to what you do. The biggest problem people don't change oil now these days. You have to see yep. you wear and you bottom it. Yep. People forgot to change. Because it's the dirt. What yeah. What happens on the end here is the same that happens on on the bottom end of a of a, a lifter. Remember we were discussing yeah. lifters, right? It's just the hydraulic piston inside, they're activated by oil pressure. But on the inside of the lifter is is a dead end cave, and the sludge sits inside there, and the, and the sludge, the oil offense, remember we learned that from um, refinery? Correct. When the oil breaks down, it gets waxy and it starts to hold on to that piston. Like grease. Same thing happens there. Yes. Grease. The oil breaks down. So, so there you get no oil flow into the phaser when you accelerate, so the solenoid closes. However, it works both ways. Jet, yeah, generally. Each man. My manufacturer is going to tell you exactly what they do, okay. what we are concerned with. Okay. So if you go for I have a command, yeah. and we have a reaction. Okay. Right? And that's that's what we do. We try yeah. and flat rate all our problems, yeah. right? Command it with your scan tool. Do I hear the phaser working? Can I see a degree change yeah. on my camshaft sensor on my data stream? It must be working. If, if I don't have a change, then I'm pointed in the right direction. How they do it? Okay, his 40 is the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. It advances. And they, everybody thinks they got the right way. Oh, yeah. As long as, right. as it works. Yeah, it, it, it's the right idea. Yes. Sir, uh, if I take this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sir. <laughs> We're going to have to have a talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. If I uh, take this bar. Uh, and think about You're going to have to this big. <laughs> <laughs> what? If you so check it's that. no problem if, uh, if I check this uh, and think about timing to this, uh, remove the socket and I direct the battery, positive, negative, to check only if it's working. Or the, the solar thing. The solar. I, you know what? You should be able to command it with your yeah, scan tool. Yeah, yeah. uh, yes. Bidirectional. Uh, if you don't have a bidirectional scan tool, you're falling behind the race. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Yeah. You can't do it without a bi-directional scan tool. You can't do anything in the industry now. So you, you need full OBD2. You need full data stream. But it's got to be bi-directional. Yeah. You've got to listen to what the ECM is telling you. And you've got to be able to tell the ECM, this is what I want to happen. And that, that's, is, bi, that's bi-directional. And, that okay? this, uh, and go into your tests. Okay, now, we go into your test. Not all manufacturers allow you to do that. But look in your tests first. Why am I going to take it off and then set up jumper wires and everything when I can do it on the car? <laughs> right? If I can do it with my scan tool, we're cooking. Okay? So, bi-directional. You've got to be able to, if you can command it through the test procedures, then command it and look at your camshaft sensor. Is is your camshaft turning? Is it is it working? Now back to your original question: Can you bench test that? Yeah, probably. But is it doing the right thing? Is it traveling enough? Uh, Are you putting the right amount of voltage? You have to do more studying. But work with your scan tool first. That's the fastest way. That's the fastest way. Okay. But if you're doing multiple repairs, multiple solenoids, you, 
you've got your problems, not your solenoid. It's not. Okay, cars are cars are too good now for that. The manufacturing process is is too good. The the, the I think quality control, control quality control is too high. You're not going to get multiple multiple failures. If you do, there'd be a recall. Yeah. Okay. You have to you have to trust what you're putting in. At some point, you have to trust that it's good. Pardon me. I don't think newer cars are built that any better. They're just trying to break down more out of the Bluetooth. Right? There's more stuff to go along. I I think. What we have now, what we what we deliver to the customer, yeah. is far far superior to what we were delivering thirty years ago. Yeah, I think it's far superior to what we were delivering in the seventies and the eighties, yeah. where we had where we had forty feet of rubber hose on the intake. Uh, um, you know, where we had an ECM that was about as powerful as, hell, my, my cell phone now could be any ECM that was that I could build yeah. 25 years ago. Yeah, we got, yeah. You know, uh, the answering machine I have is more powerful now than the computer they had when they landed on the moon. Yeah. We are building better cars because we have better controls. Now, the computer industry has, has driven our manufacturing process, that's our window of quality control. Yeah. Where quality control was, you put the key in the ignition, as uh, a start, bingo. You know, now it's, now it's got to start, you've got to have full, full instrumentation, you've got to be able to buy directional control, your Bluetooth has to work. People won't buy a car if they can't pay their phone in 15 seconds. Yeah. It's a fact yeah. now these days. It has to work that bad. And it's all because of electronics. Yeah. Probably that. Yeah. But still, we're building engines now that are easily lasting 300,000 feet. Yeah, they're a lot better than these. Okay. Yeah. And back in the day, in the 80s, even 90s, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you got 150,000 out of an engine, you were doing okay. Yeah, but most of the car I see that. And all the fuel injected. No, yeah. No, you know, yeah. you were getting, if you got 200K out of an engine. That's when you were doing really good. Get rid of it and sell it to the Fraser Valley. Yeah. Or something like that. Or, or, can, can I'm serious. Now the wiring, like what I meant is the wiring, the switches. Yeah. It's all and more secure. Well, you see them working. They go like some function connection. Get screws and then the wires start to get so, well, I've got to eat. You've got to eat. Exactly. You know? But not as bad as it was where you tell the customer, I don't know, it stalls a little bit. You know, start it up again. <laughs> Back in the day, I had to tell that to customer. I, I don't know because we had no diagrams. We had no idea. No proper wiring diagrams. Plugged in the connector and I forgot about it. Something a little more. Yeah, but some, sometimes the testimony, they don't understand you know, what kind of electronics can be sold the engine. They say, you know, what? That's whole change it. I said, how can I change it? Change it. It's still the same problem. So, Mister, I, I need to pinpoint test. Yes. So I have to put my time on that. Yeah. I said, why? Why you put time on that? Doing that? Huh? I can't answer the answer on that. It's the hardest. Don't waste your time with them. Yeah. Bye. Have a nice day. So Move is, on to the next one. Because you're going to end up working for nothing. You look until okay, yeah. ten minutes done. I know what to do. Yeah. No, not that way. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, customer knows more than anybody, and they're always right. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. If, if they do, they're that. right, if they, and if they want you to fix it in five minutes, they're right to a point. If they say no, I want you to fix it now, and you yeah. say that at some point you have to say to yourself, you know more than the customer. Well, right. Yeah. You can't yeah. tell them anything on that. No, you can't. You say, I'm sorry, I can't do it in ten minutes for you. Yeah. That's right. This is my timeline. It's open. Even. Anything and, and like that. We don't need to see the words, you know how to do it like that, like that. Yeah. The worst is when they're especially if the you're in the general a general mechanic in the aftermarket, um, it's it's really, really hard. Yeah. It's, yes. it's, it's I really pity those guys that are working in the aftermarket. So <clears throat> most of us do. 
Yeah. Yeah. Most of us do. They say, one thing changed, everything done good. Yeah. No, we no. can't do it for two. <laughs> no. You know, the, the worst is when a customer is got over the ads. That's, that's the toughest part of doing this. A buddy of mine has a sign in his garage that says, our rate per hour is $100 an hour. <laughs> you, you watch, it's $125 an hour. You help, it's $150 an hour. I like that. I really like that one. He works by himself a lot. Yep. He doesn't. Well, there's one time I was putting a muffler in my rubber mullets and I had to cut off with a brace and he was over panicking. I said, yep. relax, relax. Well, I was just I was for a time, relax. No, 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 well done. And he's trying to tell me how to do this. I said, here. Go ahead and do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like to do it. People say, you want cheap? Yeah, you want good. Cheap or you want good? Yeah. Uh, cheap or you want good? Overlasting good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. And we talk to them, oh, you know how to do it. Now, look, running the hand. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if they're going to talk you down, if they're going to talk down to you, maybe they need to go. You have to, that's, that's one of the downsides, you know, people always look down at mechanics, they don't yeah. have to. It's not nice, that's what they do. Okay, that's why I didn't want to do this Monday, because we have to deal with valves, we have to deal with ignition and, and um, that other stuff that you pour in that lights up. It's called gas. Okay, let's move on. Drive line. Oh, on the horse. Page 134, please, guys. And the tough part is done. Okay, we've done the tough two days. We're going to cruise a little bit today. If we finish early, I'd like to get into wiring. Right, some wiring lead into tomorrow because I'd like to have it all wrapped up for Friday so that Saturday we can go into the test. Um, the test, you don't get a certificate for it. All you're going to get is feedback on how well, how close you are. Okay? You may, and, and I'll, I'll, I will mark it, I bring it back with me. I'm going to mark it and I'll send you your marks in about a week and a half, okay? I, I'll do it by email. Yeah. And if I have, if I can, if you will accept it, I'll send you a PDF of your test back <laughs> so that you could actually see where, um, where, we where, where you worked. Where right? you need it. Where you it's, it's not a certificate test. You don't get a diploma for it, but you do get an idea of where you are. Okay? So, so how does it work? Is that you just come into your right place and then? We're, I, ideally, I'd like, we're going to be here at 8 o'clock, um, answer questions, whatever. I'd like to get rocking by 8.30 and finish by 12.30 if possible. It's a four-hour test. If we can do it in three and a half, that's great. Um, one o'clock, hand out certificates and uh, your receipts. And uh, I've got to be on the road by 1.30. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, Maybe a couple of beers, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's on the plane, buddy. That's on the plane. Uh, <laughs> it's only an hour. Pardon me? It's only an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you can drink a lot in an hour. Are you sure you got a mask on? A mechanic can live in this beer in an hour? You know how much we can do? All <laughs> oh, I don't drink. So. Yeah. Um, okay, we're into drive line now. What makes, so now we've got the engine, we know how much air is coming in, we know how much fuel is coming in, we're metering it, we've got that engine, that air pump working, we're creating heat, we know what's happening to the heat, we're dissipating the heat in the cooling system, we put all that together, we've got our computers working, computers are all talking together, we've got a mechanic in the seat with a bi-directional scan tool, working it, okay? okay? Let's get, put it in gear. How are we gonna put it in gear? What's the purpose of a flywheel, guys? Flywheel or a flat Fly. Flywheel. Flywheel. It's for the clutch. <laughs> that goes in the back of the body valve. That great shaft and balance is the ultimate, ultimate purpose of the flywheel. 
The ultimate purpose of the flywheel. Pardon me? Will the use reduction? Yes. yes. For the two. Two. Right. Want that weight to push it between the exhaust pulses. Otherwise, you've got an eight cylinder engine that lacks. Okay? Sorry, sir. You can't start with the one. You can. You can. There you go. There you go. That's the very good answer. <laughs> Smooths out the power pulses. Power pulses forcing downward on the connecting rod journals. They're inside the engine already. Okay. Yeah. But those power pulses are not smooth, right? Yeah. So we need something to keep that rotation of the crankshaft happening. So we've got the weight on the on the crankshaft. We have the counterweights on the crankshaft. We have the balancer on the front. That big weight on the end, the harmonic balancer, okay, absorbing those impacts, and then we put a flywheel on the back, and that big hunk of weight, right, is another balance, and will help the engine flow around. We need the flywheels. Then we're going to put teeth on the flywheel. We're going to attach that to our starter. We're going to talk about the starter tomorrow, okay, and that's how we start the car. That's the purpose of the flywheel. Then we need to power the wheels. Yeah. No. <laughs> what you said before. The clutch. Now you got the clutch on the flywheel. That's right. Now you got to put a clutch on the flywheel. That's right. Flywheel and automatic. Yeah. The heavy flywheel attached to the crankshaft absorbs the energy from each power pulse and releases that energy between power pulses. Back in the days of hot rod, you could take a Chevy made a 350 and a 400. The blocks were identical. 400 cubic inch displacement, right? So displacement was yeah. the size of the cylinder board, how much air we were moving, right? Yeah. The engines were identical. If you took the flywheel from the 350 and put it on the 400, you couldn't sit inside that car when the engine was running. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, was, it was just, it was like you had two dead cylinders. The flywheel is matched to the engine and it does do a significant amount of work to absorb the pulses. It'll also create pulses. Throw a weight off a flywheel like this and you'll know it right away. I've had that problem yeah. on a flywheel. I have flex brake every place one time. Yeah. And it was the wrong application. Man, that car was ever shaking. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's very specific. When you order them yeah. and, and you put the two on the bench, and they look identical. This one has a different amount of weight on it. Yeah. Flywheels for internally balanced engines are evenly balanced around their entire circumference. Flywheels for externally balanced engines have a heavy spot on one side for the <coughs> balancing of the engine. The bolt holes for mounting the flywheel to the crankshaft flange are not evenly spaced. This is typical for most flywheels and ensures that a flywheel can only be installed in one position. Correct. Okay, you guys have all done this, so we're gonna we'll move on. Okay, just yeah. Yeah. just keep nodding. You okay, sir? There. Yes. Sir. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Who said that? Point him out. Our call. Oh, <coughs> my friend. Uh, we see you. We see you. Yeah, now we see you. <laughs> now we see you. Okay, automatic transmission vehicles, the flex plate, you see we're laughing, it's the third day, we're doing okay, we're having fun. The flex plate and torque converter act as the flywheel, okay, so let's get a torque converter in there, let's fill it with oil, spin it around, it's going to absorb even more vibration. Yeah, that's for the automatic transmission. Yes, in these applications, balance weight are added to the flex plate or torque converter when external balancing is required. We've done the flywheels there. We'll talk about clutches later. Let's do some axles.
drive axles are final output members of the drive axle on stem lead. They can vary in the function they must perform as well as how they are supported and retained in the assembly. Where does that bring us? What kind of axles do we have? Loading and Semi-floating and fair floating. And they can vary the functions they must perform as well as how they are supported and retained. Axle designs are fully dependent on the style of the axle cube. In some cases, the axle bearing is subjected to all the thrust forces. Other axle designs transfer some of the forces involved to other bearings in the drive axle assembly, such as the differential side bearing. Since the type of bearing used determines what method is used to retain the axle, and in some cases how the bearing is lubricated, you'll need to know this information. Axle shafts are made of either hot forged or extruded steel. The large flange is, in, is impact extruded onto one end, and the splines are machined. Impact extruded means it pressed when this shaft is a molded piece of metal. When it's red, they press it and it spreads out, then they machine it so that it's all one piece. Oh, with a flange? Is it all one big bit and they machine it up there? Yeah, like, oh, okay. Just like they do a crank. Yeah. So, impact extruded. So they take the shaft, yeah. drag, and then they, they just plow it into a, a rough surface, it spreads out, then they machine it straight. After it cools down. Yeah. After yeah. it cools down, yes. And it could be forged, or what's the other term? I, I cast. Okay, it won't be cast, it won't be forged. Yeah. I've seen a bet. Not, not an automotive. No, I probably won't. Right, I mean, yeah, it'll, it's all cast. Yeah. Then we've got splines which we're going to put inside our differential. Some wheel studs. And then we're going to be able to bolt our wheel on there. We'll get into wheels on Saturday. Okay, that's rear wheel drive, right? That would be a rear wheel drive, yeah. Okay. Solid axle. Solid axle, okay, we'll do that. Sandy floating. Are the most common type. Semi floating, you would take. Sorry. Yeah. There you go, that's a better picture. Semi floating, we know this type. Take our center pin out of our differential, push our axle in, take out our C clip. Pop our axle out. Semi floating. Our seal here, very common to replace it. The bearing, you're not going to do many. Not now. You hardly see this anymore. Hardly see this anymore. You'll do the occasional bearing. I actually do a lot there. Do you? Oh. So <coughs> Lucky. I love them. I know, you know, that's one of my fears. Dips. I'm five foot four. <laughs> <laughs> I'm five foot four, I weigh 150 pounds. Stay away. Stay away. Stay away. Clutches and these yeah. other feet. I don't even like doing tires anymore. <laughs> yeah. You get this machine. I'm just tired of doing tires. I hate tires. <laughs> just put the tire there. Scorching machine. It picks up the tire yeah. and it all. Ah. <laughs> this bearing transfers the weight of the vehicle from the axle housing to the axle, from the housing to the axle, which then transfers it through the wheel, through the flange and our wheel turns. The inner end of the axle floats in the axle gear or side gears rather than being supported by a bearing. So this, that's why it's called a floating. Semi-floating, sorry. Semi-floating. Full floating. Semi-floating. 
both fuck. Um. Also transmit side thrust to the axle housing. Side thrust is generated whenever a vehicle turns and <coughs> front wheels direct the vehicle in the direction of the corner, but the vehicle tends to want to go in the direction opposite the turn. This creates a side thrust on the wheels that is transmitted through the axle bearings to the vehicle. Side thrust on the outside wheel generates an inward force pushing the axle towards the differential. Side thrust on the inside wheel generates an outward force pulling the axle away from the differential. <laughs> and you'll see that where these are worn out, where yep. those C-clips yep. are worn out, yep. to the point where you can't get them out, where they're kind of curved. Um, oh. Can you replace it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen where they come right up. The whole axle just Oh pulls. yeah, oh yeah, pulls right up. Oh, yeah. you see? Well, the car is getting wider. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Semi-floating axles. Transfer torque to and from the wheels to accelerate and decelerate vehicle. Transmit side thrust through the housing. Support the weight of the vehicle. And with the wheel flange, provide a mounting point for wheels or brake rotors to the yeah. That's page 137, sorry. Semi-floating axle bearings. There are three different types of semi-floating axles, each distinguished by the type of axle bearing mounted inside the housing. The type of bearing also determines how the axle bearing is side thrust to the axle housing. Somebody else want to read for a minute? Anybody? Want to read for a minute? Yeah, read for a minute. Ball bearing type semi floating axles are supported at the outer end of the axle shaft by a single ball bearing assembly, which is pressed onto the shaft near the flange end. The bearing assembly is held in place on the shaft by a thick steel retainer. So, we have our axle, which is one piece. Yeah. <coughs> we slide our bearing on, comes up against this abutment. Okay? Correct. And then there's steel retainer, which is pressed on. I can do it with the press, Chrysler. You can do it with a pipe, jerky. Hammer, chisel, you're in the bush somewhere. <laughs> Hey, it's got to be done. <laughs> yeah, why not? And you always replace it when you replace it. Always when you replace the bearing, don't forget to put the flange on first. <laughs> Last again. No, 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 no. It's the bearing. No reason. Yeah, the bearing that rolled back. First you put the seal, you put the bearing, the airbrush ball, and you put the last, the, uh, the little spacer there on the collar that holds that bearing. Yeah. That collar right here. It comes to the kit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, very common problems on, on uh, yeah. some of these applications. I've done lots of <coughs> gear oil. You can drive all sorts of things surfacing everywhere in the back. Or smoke. Yes. <coughs> yes. The straight roller bearing type semi floating axle. 138. <coughs> Single straight roller bearing assembly is driven onto the axle tube and is lubricated by gear oil from the final drive assembly. The seal is located outboard of the bearing to prevent gear oil from leaking onto the brakes. The rollers of the bearing assembly run directly on a machine and hardened surface on the axle shaft. <coughs> You'll hear a harmonic sound for a bearing like that, which will increase that. That harmonic sound that'll it'll, it'll make a lot of noise, it'll go away, a lot of noise, it'll go away. It'll increase, the sound will increase as you're turning. 
yeah. put a load on that bearing, right? Throw it, throw it from find a find a section of highway where you can throw the weight left and right. You'll hear it. You'll pick it up. Is that when the sign is gone? <coughs> Pardon me. Is that the sign when the bearing is gone? Yeah. Okay. That's good. I can be overhauling it. Just replace the bearing sheet, anyways. Yeah. You could feel a bearing. You can you can take it out. You'll roll it. You'll feel it even when it's in the housing. Yeah, the axles are out anyway. Right, if you are doing the diff, just do the complete thing. Look at the axles. Is, is there a pattern? Is there a pattern?